preface of english men of science their nature and nurture by francis galton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by leon harvey preface i undertook the inquiry of which this volume is the result after reading the recent work of m d Kendall in which he analyses the salient events of the history of two hundred scientific men who have lived during the two past centuries deducing therefrom many curious conclusions which will repay the attention of thoughtful readers it also happened that i myself had been leisurely engaged on a parallel but more extended investigation namely as regards men of ability of all descriptions with the view of supplementing at some future time my work on hereditary genius the object of that book was to assert the claims of one of what may be called the pre-efficience of eminent men the importance of which had been previously overlooked i yet to work out more fully its relative efficiency as compared with those of education tradition fortune opportunity and much else it was therefore with no ordinary interest that i studied m d cantal's work finding in it many new ideas and much confirmation of my own opinions also not a little criticism supported as i can see by very imperfect biographical evidence of my published views on hereditary i thought it best to test the value of this descent at once by limiting my first publication to the same field as that on which m d Candell had worked namely to the history of men of science and to investigate their sociology from wholly new ample and trustworthy materials this i have done in the present volume and i am confident that one effect of the evidence here collected will be to strengthen the utmost claims i ever made for the recognition of the importance of hereditary influence a few of my results and some of the evidence on which they were based were given to me at a friday evening lecture february eighteen seventy four before the royal institution i have incorporated parts of that lecture into this volume with emendations and large additions it has been my wish to work up the materials i possess with much minuteness but some months of careful labour made it clear to me that they were not sufficient to bear a more strict or elaborate treatment than i have now given to them the pleasant duty remains of acknowledging a debt to my friend mr herbert spencer for many helpful suggestions and for his encouragement when i was planning this work and to reiterate my deep sense of gratitude to numerous correspondents which i have expressed elsewhere in the following pages i may add that four of the scientific men who replied to my questions had passed away since i began to write of these two had sent me complete returns namely professor phillips the geologist and sir william fairbairn the engineer as regards the other two sir henry holland the physician had published his autobiography but it gave me much help colloquially and promised more and sir edmund better known as count streselicki the australian traveller and meteorologist furnished me with very suggestive information but too incomplete for statistical use francis galton forty two rutland gate november eighteen seventy four p s i have to apologize for some faults of style in the earlier pages due to my not having had as full an opportunity as i had counted upon of correcting that portion of the press after i had sent the above to the printer a friend happened to point out to me the following passage in the sarto resartus of carlyle book two chapter two it expresses sentiments so nearly akin to those which induced me to write this book that i am glad to quote it it is maintained by helvidius and his set that an infant of genius is quite the same as any other infant only that certain surprisingly favourable influences accompanying him through life especially through childhood and expand him while others lay close folded at continued dunces with which opinion cries tuffelstrock i should as soon agree as with this other that an acorn might by favourable or unfavourable influences of soil and climate be nursed into a cabbage or the cabbage seed into an oak nevertheless continues he i to acknowledge the all but omnipotence of early culture and nurture hereby we have either a dotted dwarf bush or a high towering wide shadowing tree either a sick yellow cabbage or an edible luxuriant green one of a truth it is the duty of all men especially of all philosophers to note down with accuracy the characteristic circumstances of their education what furthered what hindered what in any way modified it end of preface to English men of science.
Chapter One, Part One of English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. English Men of Science, Chapter One Antecedents. Object of Book Definition of Man of Science Data Nature and Nurture Race and Birthplace Occupation of Parents and Position in Life Physical Peculiarities of Parents Primogenitor Fertility Heredity Pedigrees Statistical Results The intent of this book is to supply what may be termed a natural history of the English men of science of the present day. It will describe their earliest antecedents, including the hereditary influences, the inborn qualities of their mind and body, the causes that first induced them to pursue science, the education they received, and their opinions on its merits. The advantages are great of confining the investigation to men of our own period and nation. Our knowledge of them is more complete, and where deficient it may be supplemented by further inquiry. They are subject to a moderate range of these influences which have the largest disturbing power, and are therefore well fitted for statistical investigation. Lastly, the results we may obtain are of direct practical interest. The inquiry is a complicated one at the best. It is advantageous not to complicate it further by dealing with notabilities whose histories are seldom autobiographical, never complete, and not always very accurate, and who lived under the varied and imperfectly appreciated conditions of European life in several countries and numerous periods during many different centuries. Definition of Man of Science I do not attempt to define a scientific man, because no frontier line or definition exists which separates any group of individuals from the rest of the species. Natural groups have nuclei but no outlines. They blend on every side with other systems whose nuclei have alien characters. A naturalist must construct his picture of nature on the same principle that an engraver in mesotint proceeds on his plate beginning with the principal lights as so many different points of departure and working outwards from each of them until the intervening spaces are covered some definition of an ideal scientific man might possibly be given and accepted but who is to decide in each case whether particular individuals fall within the definition it seems to me the best way to take the verdict of the scientific world as expressed in definite language it may be over lenient in some cases in others it may never have been uttered but on the whole it appears more satisfactory than any other verdict which exists or is attainable to have been elected a fellow of the royal society since the reform in the mode of election introduced by mr justice grove nearly thirty years ago is a real essay of scientific merit owing to various reasons many excellent men of science of mature ages may not be fellows but those who bear the title cannot be considered in some degree as entitled to the epithet of scientific i therefore look upon this fellowship as a past examination so to speak and from among the fellows of the royal society are select those who have yet further qualifications one of these is a fact of having earned a medal for scientific work another of having presided over a learned society or a section of the british association another of having been elected on the council of the royal society another of being professor at some important college or university these and a few other similar signs of being appreciated by contemporary men of science are the qualifications for which i have looked in selecting my list of typical scientific men i have only deviated from the technical rules in two or three cases where there appeared good reason for their relaxation and where the returns appeared likely to be of peculiar interest on these principles i drew up a list of one hundred and eighty men most of them were qualified on more than one count and many on several counts also the list appeared nearly exhaustive in respect to those men of mature age who lived in or near london since other private tests suggested few additions as two of these tests have been proposed by several correspondents so it may be well to describe them the one is the election of individuals on account of their scientific eminence to a certain well-known literary and scientific club the name of which it is unnecessary to mention the committee of this club have the power of electing annually out of their regular turn nine persons eminent for science literature art or public services 
the two or three men who have in each year received this coveted privilege on the grounds of science now amount to a considerable number and they are all on my list again there are certain dining clubs in connection with the royal society the one meeting on the afternoon of every evening that it meets and the other more rarely and there are about fifty members to each of these clubs the same persons being in many instances members of both the election to either of the clubs is a testimony of some value to the estimation of the scientific status of a man by his contemporaries almost all their members are on my list no doubt many persons of considerable position living in edinburgh dublin and elsewhere at a distance from london are not among those with whose experiences i am about to deal but that is no objection i do not profess or care to be exhaustive in my data only desiring to have a sufficiency of material and to be satisfied that it is good so far as it goes and a perfectly fair sample i do not particularly want a list that shall include every man of science in england but seek for one that is sufficiently extended for my purposes and that contains none but truly scientific men in the usual acceptation of that word however i have made some further estimates and conclude that an exhaustive list of men of the british isles of the same mature ages and general scientific status of those of whom i have been speaking would amount to three hundred but not to more some of my readers may feel surprised that so many as three hundred persons are to be found in the united kingdom who deserve the title of scientific men probably they have been accustomed to concentrate their attention upon a few notabilities and to ignore their colleagues it must however be recollected that all biographies even of the greatest men reveal numerous associates and competitors whose merit and influence were far greater than had been suspected by the outside world great discoveries have often been made simultaneously by workers ignorant of each other's labours this shows that they had derived their inspiration from a common but hidden source as no mere chance would account for simultaneous discovery in illustration of this view it will suffice to mention a few of the great discoveries of this generation that of photography is most intimately associated with the name of Nippy, Daguerre, and Talbot, who were successful in 1839 along different lines of research. But Thomas Wedgwood was a photographer in 1802, though he could not fix his pictures. As to the origin of species, Wallace is well known to have had an independent share in its discovery side by side with the far more comprehensive investigations of Darwin in spectrum analysis the remarks of stokes were interior to and independent of the works of kirchhoff and bunsen electric telegraphy has numerous parents german english and american the idea of conservation of energy has unnumbered roots the simultaneous discovery of the planet neptune on theoretical grounds by leverrier and adams is a very curious instance of what we are considering in patent inventions the fact of simultaneous discovery is notoriously frequent it would therefore appear that few discoveries are wholly due to a single man but rather that vague and imperfect ideas which float in conversation and literature must grow gather and develop until some more perspicacious and prompt mind than the rest clearly sees them thus laplace is understood to have seized on kant's nebular hypothesis and bentham on priestley's phrase the greatest happiness of the greatest number and each of them elaborated the idea he had so seized into a system the first discoverers beat their contemporaries in point of time and by doing so they become leaders of thought they direct the intellectual energy of the day into the channels they opened it would have run in, in other channels but for their labour it is therefore due to them not that science progresses but that a progress is as rapid as it is and in the direction towards which they themselves have striven we must neither underrate nor overrate their achievements i would compare the small band of men who would achieve a conspicuous scientific position to islands which are not the detached objects they appear to the vulgar eye but only the uppermost portions of hills whose bulk is unseen to pursue this metaphor the range of my inquiry dips a few fathoms below the level at which popular reputation begins it is of interest to know the ratio which the numbers of the leading scientific men bear to the population of england generally i obtain it in this way although one hundred and eighty persons only were on my list i reckon as already mentioned that it would have been possible to have included three hundred of the same ages without descending in the scale of scientific position also it appears that the ages of half of the number of my list lie between fifty and sixty-five and that about three-quarters of these may be considered 
for census comparisons as English. I combine these numbers and compare them with that of the male population of England and Wales between the same limits of age, and find the required ratio to be about 1 in 10,000. What then are the conditions of nature, and the various circumstances and conditions of life, which I include under the general name of nurture, which have selected the one and left the remainder? The object of this book is to answer this question. Data my data are the autobiographical replies to a very long series of printed questions addressed severally to the 180 men whose names were in the list I have described, and they fill two large portfolios. I cannot sufficiently thank my correspondents for the courteousness with which they replied to my very troublesome queries, the great pains they have taken to be precise and truthful in their statements, and the confidence reposed in my discretion. Those of the answers which are selected for statistical treatment somewhat exceed 100 in number. In addition to these, I have utilized several others which were too incomplete for statistical purposes, or which arrived late, but these also have been of real service to me, sometimes in corroborating at others in questioning previous provisional conclusions. I wish emphatically to add that the foremost members of the scientific world have contributed in full proportion to their numbers. It must not for a moment be supposed that mediocrity is unduly represented in my data. Natural history is an impersonal result. I am therefore able to treat my subject anonymously, with the exception of one chapter in which the pedigrees of certain families are given. Nature and Nurture The phrase nature and nurture is a convenient jingle of words, for it separates under two distinct heads the innumerable elements of which personality is composed. Nature is all that a man brings with himself into the world. Nurture is every influence from without that affects him after his birth. The distinction is clear. The one produces the infant, such as it actually is, including its latent faculties of growth of body and mind. The other affords the environment amid which the growth takes place by which natural tendencies may be strengthened or thwarted, or wholly new ones implanted. Neither of the terms implies any theory. Natural gifts may or may not be hereditary. Nurture does not especially consist of food, clothing, education, or tradition, but it includes all these and similar influences, whether known or unknown. When nature and nurture compete for supremacy on equal terms in the sense to be explained, the former proves the stronger. It is needless to insist that neither is self-sufficient. The highest natural endowments may be stuffed by defective nurture, while no carefulness of nurture can overcome the evil tendencies of an intrinsically bad physique, weak brain, or brutal disposition. Differences of nurture stamp unmistakable marks on the disposition of the soldier, clergyman, or scholar, but are wholly insufficient to efface the deeper marks of individual character. The impress of class distinctions is superficial and may be compared to those which give a general resemblance to a family of daughters at a provincial ball, all dressed alike, and so similar in voice and address as to puzzle a recently introduced partner in his endeavours to recollect with which of them he is engaged to dance. But an intimate friend forgets their general resemblance in the presence of the far greater dissimilarity which he has learned to appreciate. There are twins of the same sex so alike in body and mind that not even their own mothers can distinguish them. Their features, voice and expressions are similar. They see things in the same light and their ideas follow the same laws of association. This close resemblance necessarily gives way under the gradually accumulated influences of difference of nurture, but it often lasts till manhood. I have been told of a case in which two twin brothers, both married, the one a medical man and the other a clergyman, were staying at the same house. One morning for a joke, they changed their neckties, and each impersonated the other, sitting by his wife through the whole of the breakfast without discovery. Shakespeare was a close observer of nature. It is therefore worth recollecting that he recognises in his 36 plays three pairs of family likenesses, so deceptive as to create absurd confusion. Two of these pairs are in the Comedy of Errors, and the other in Twelfth Night, Volume 1. I heard of a case not many years back in which a young Englishman had travelled to St. Petersburg, then much less accessible than now, with no letters of introduction, and who lost his pocket-book, and was penniless. He was walking along the quay in some despair at his prospects, when he was startled by the cheery voice of a stranger who accosted him, saying he required no introduction because his family likeness proclaimed him to be the son of an old friend. 
The Englishman did not conceal his difficulties, and the stranger actually lent him the sum he needed on the guarantee of his family likeness, confirmed, no doubt, by some conversation. In this and similar instances, how small has been the influence of nurture. The child had developed into manhood along a predestined course laid out in his nature. It would be impossible to find a converse instance in which two persons, unlike at their birth, had been moulded by similarity of nurture into so close a resemblance that their nearest relations failed to distinguish them. Let us quote Shakespeare again as an illustration in A Midsummer Night's Dream. 3.2 Helena and Hermia, who had been inseparable in childhood and girlhood, and had identical nurture. So we grew together, like to a double cherry seeming parted, but yet a union in partition. We're physically quite unlike. The one was short and dark, the other tall and fair. Therefore the similarity of their nurture did not affect their features. The moral likeness was superficial, because a sore trial of temper, which produced a violent quarrel between them, brought out great dissimilarity of character. In the competition between nature and nurture, when the differences in either case do not exceed those which distinguish individuals of the same race living in the same country under no very exceptional conditions, nature certainly proves the stronger of the two. Race and Birthplace As regards the race of the scientific men on my list, it has already been mentioned that for the purpose of a census enumeration, three-fourths may be considered English, but their precise origin is as follows. Omitting a few Germans, out of every ten scientific men, five are pure English, one is Anglo-Welsh, one is Anglo-Irish, one is pure Scotch, one includes Anglo-Scotch, Scotch-Irish, pure Irish, Welsh, Manx, and Channel Islands. Finally, one is unclassed. These unclassed are of extremely mixed origin. One is in about equal degrees English, Irish, French, and German. Another is English, Scotch, Creole, and Dutch. Another English, Dutch, Creole, and Swedish, and so on. I trust the reader knows what Creoles are. Namely, the descendants of white families long settled in a tropical colony, and that he does not confound the term with mulattoes. I give this information without being able to make much present use of it. Is chiefly intended to serve as a standard with which other natural groups may hereafter be compared, such as groups of artists or of literary men. One would desire to know whether persons in England generally show so great a diversity of origin, but it is somewhat difficult to answer the question owing to a want of precision in the word generally. If we were to go to rural districts or small stagnant towns, we should find much less variety of origin. But I think there would be quite as much in the more energetic classes of the metropolis who have immigrated from all quarters. Some haphazard selecting which I tried confirmed this view. Then comes the important question. Is this a sign that a mixture of one or more of the various civilized races is more conductive to form an able offspring? No doubt the varied nurture, due to separate streams of tradition, has great influence in awakening original thought, but we are not speaking of this now. The question is about nature. On an analysis of the scientific status of the men on my list, it appeared to me that their ability is high in proportion to their numbers among those of pure race. The border men and lowland Scotch come out exceedingly well. The Anglo-Irish and Anglo-Welsh, notwithstanding eminent individual exceptions, would as a whole rank last. Owing to my list not being exhausted, I hardly like to attempt conclusions as to the precise productiveness of scientific ability of the Scotch, English and Irish, severally, but there cannot be a shadow of doubt that its degrees are in the order I have named. The birthplace of scientific men and of their parents are usually in towns away from the sea coast. Out of every five birthplaces, I found that one lies in London or its suburbs, one in an important town such as Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dublin, Birmingham, Liverpool, or Manchester. One is in a small town, and two, either in a village or actually in the country. These returns are given with more detail in the footnote. The branch of science pursued is often in curious disaccord with the surrounding influence of the birthplace. Mechanicans are usually hardy lads born in the country. Biologists are frequently pure townsfolk. 
partially in consequence of the prevalence of their urban distribution i find that an irregular plot may be marked on the map of england which includes much less than one half of its area but more than ninety two per cent of the birthplaces of the english scientific men or of their parents the accompanying diagram shows its position one thin arm abuts on the sea between hastings and folkestone and runs northwards over london and birmingham where it is joined by another thin arm preceding from cornwall and devonshire crossing the bristol channel to swansea and thence to worcester the two arms are now combined into one of double breadth it covers nottingham shrewsbury liverpool and manchester above these latitudes it again narrows and after sending a small branch to hull proceeds northwards to newcastle edinburgh and glasgow thus there are large areas in england and wales outside this irregular plot which are very deficient in aboriginal science one comprises the whole of the eastern counties another includes the huge triangle at whose angles hastings worcester and exeter or rather exmouth are situated occupation of parents and position in life my list contains men who have been born in every social grade from the highest order in the peerage down to the factory hand and simple peasant but the returns which i shall discuss do not range quite so widely these are ninety-six in number and may be classified as follows but the same name appears in two classes on eleven occasions so that the total entries are raised to one hundred and seven noblemen and private gentlemen nine army and navy six civil service nine subordinate officers three total eighteen law eleven medical nine clergy ministers six teachers six architect one secretary to an insurance office one total thirty four bankers seven merchants twenty one manufacturers fifteen total forty three farmers two others one total of one hundred and seven the terms used in the third and fourth groups must be understood in a very general sense. Thus, there are some merchants on a very small scale indeed, and others on a very large one. It is by no means the case that those who have raised themselves by their abilities are found to be abler than their contemporaries who began their careers with advantages of fortune and social position. They are not more distinguished as original investigators, neither are they more discerning in those numerous questions not strictly scientific which happen to be brought before the councils of scientific societies there can be no doubt but that the upper classes of a nation like our own which are largely and continually recruited by selections from below are by far the most productive of natural ability the lower classes are in truth the residuum of the six clergymen or ministers who were fathers of scientific men no less than four appear in a second category viz one clergyman and schoolmaster two physician afterwards clergyman three unitarian minister and schoolmaster four professor of classics afterwards an independent minister among the successful graduates of oxford and cambridge and among purely literary men we find a much larger proportion of sons of clergymen there is at Cambridge a well-known university scholarship, called The Bell, which is open only to sons of clergymen of the Church of England. As it has been chiefly given for classical proficiency, we may be almost sure that the senior classic of his year, if he were the son of a clergyman, would also be a Bell scholar. I looked through the lists and found that out of 45 senior classics, 1824 to 68 inclusive, 10 had gained the scholarship whence i conclude that at least one out of every four or five cambridge graduates is the son of a clergyman at this rate out of one hundred cambridge graduates twenty-two would have had clergymen of the church of england for their fathers whereas out of one hundred scientific men only three or four were so circumstanced it is therefore a fact that in proportion to the pains bestowed on their education generally the sons of clergymen rarely take a lead in science the pursuit of science is uncongenial to the priestly character it has fallen to my lot to serve for many years on the councils of many scientific societies and excepting a very few astronomers and mathematicians about whom i will speak directly i can only recall three colleagues who were clergymen curiously enough two of these the revs baden powell and dunbar heath have been prosecuted for unorthodoxy 
The third was Bishop Wilberforce, who can hardly be said to have loved science. He rarely attended the meetings, but delighted in administration and sought openings for indirect influence. The reason for the abstinence of clergymen from scientific work cannot be that they are too busy, too much home tied, or cramped in pecuniary means, because other professional men, more busy, more at the call of others, and having less assured revenues, are abundantly presented on all the council lists. Not caring to trust my unaided recollections, I have examined the council lists of ten scientific societies at or near the three periods, 1850, 1860, 1870. There have been changes in some of the societies, and there are many trifling peculiarities of detail, tedious and unnecessary here to deal with, but the following statement is substantially correct. The ordinary members of council are on a rough general average twenty in number to each of the following societies. 1. Royal. 2. British Association. 3. Astronomical. 4. Chemical. 5. Geological. 6. Linnean. 7. Zoological. 8. Geographical. 9 and 10. The two predecessors of the recently established Anthropological Institute. Viz. Ethnological and Anthropological. 11. Statistical. Therefore, as we are dealing with three distinct periods, eleven societies and twenty members of council to each, there have been about three multiplied by eleven multiplied by twenty equals six hundred and sixty separate appointments. Clergymen have held only sixteen of these, or one in forty, and they have in nearly every case been attached to those subdivisions of science which have fewer salient points to scratch or jar against dogma. Thus Professor Chalice, Dr. Lloyd, Dr. Robinson, Dr. Wewell. Rev. J. Fisher, Rev. W. Webb, Rev. Vernon Harcourt, Prof. Pritchard, Prof. Price, Rev. J. Barlow, and Prof. Willis are all chiefly connected with astronomy, physics, and mathematics. The five remaining names are those of the Rev. G. C. Renard, the Geographer, Bishop Wilberforce, and the Rev. Dunbar Heath, of whom I have already spoken the Rev. Dr. Nicholson, and the Rev. Canon Greenwell. There is not a single biologist among them. Physical Peculiarities of Parents It has been frequently asserted that certain physical peculiarities in the parents clash, and that others combine happily in the offspring. I therefore thought it well to make inquiries as to the figure, complexion, colour of hair, height, and other physical peculiarities of the fathers and mothers of the scientific men. I also asked about the temperaments, if they were marked, but the answers to these were few. Tables showing the number of cases in which there has been harmony, indifference or contrast between various physical peculiarities of the two parents. Are tables displayed on the page, the temperament of parents. Summary, harmony, 10 cases, contrast, 2, indifferent, 10, total, 22. Tables displayed on page, colour of hair of parents. Summary, harmony, 44 cases, contrast 6, indifferent, 22, total, 72. I have in addition 11 cases of coloured hair, yellowish, sandy, red, light auburn, dark auburn, chestnut, but not one case of strict harmony among them. A table is displayed on the page, figure of parents of scientific men. Summary, harmony, 24 cases, contrast 23, indifferent 24, total 71. The foregoing tables show results bearing on the question whether harmony or contrast prevails in the physical characteristics of the parents. I think they must be accepted as decidedly in favour of harmony. The grand totals which they give are 78 cases of harmony, 31 of contrast and 56 of indifference. In short, there is more purity of breed in scientific men than would have resulted from haphazard marriages. In the temperaments of their parents, harmony strongly prevails over contrast, the proportion being five to one in favour of the former. Colour of hair, harmony is twice as frequent as contrast. In figure, it is equally common because corpulent, stout or plump persons of one sex seem to have a peculiar and reciprocated liking for spare, neat or small persons of the other. This is literally the only case in these tables where a love of contrast equals that of harmony. 
I came to much the same conclusions by giving appropriate marks for harmony, contrast, and indifference to each quality in each case, thus obtaining aggregate marks for every pair, which I treated on much the same principle that their separate qualities are treated in the table. As regards height, there is a stricter method of investigation, which statisticians will appreciate. It is well known by repeated experience that the heights of men and of women in any large group are distributed according to the law of frequency of error. In other words, the proportionate numbers of people of different heights corresponds to what would have been the case supposing stature to be due to the aggregate action of many small and independent variable causes. The probability is inconceivably small that all the independent causes should in any given case cooperate to produce an excess of height. If they did so, the result will be a Brobdicknagian giant, or that they should all cooperate to produce a deficiency in height, in which case the result would be a Lilliputian dwarf. On the other hand, the probability is great that the number and effects of the causes in excess and those in deficiency of their several average values will be pretty equal. As for these and all other intermediate cases, their relative frequency is determined by the above law, which is based on that by which the relative frequency of different runs of luck is calculated. I now proceed to apply this law. I have 62 cases in which the heights of both parents are given numerically, whence it appears that 1. The average height of the fathers is between 5 foot 9 inches and 5 foot 9 and a quarter inches, and that their distribution conforms closely to the law of frequency of error, the probable error of the series being 1.7 inches. 2. The average height of the mothers is 5 foot 4.5 inches, and the distribution of their heights conforms fairly to the above-mentioned law, the probable error of the series being 1.9 inches. It follows from the well-known properties of the law in question that if there had been no sexual selection in respect of height, the sum of the heights of the two parents would also conform to the law of frequency of error. It appears from the facts in this chapter that the marriages of parents of the scientific men on my list actually tended to produce differentiation and purity of race. My data concerning the parents of men of other groups are insufficient to enable me yet to give comparative results showing how far the selective sexual interests of the population generally would thwart, be indifferent to, or cooperate with the influences of future social restrictions on unsuitable marriages or encouragement of suitable ones. Primogenitor, etc. The following statements shows, in percentages, the position of the scientific men in respect to age among their brothers and sisters. Only sons, 22 cases. Eldest sons, 26 cases. Youngest sons, 15 cases. Of those who are neither eldest nor youngest, 13 come in the elder half of the family, 12 in the younger half, and 11 are exactly in the middle. Total, 99. It further appears that, at the time of the birth of the scientific men, the ages of their fathers averaged 36 years, and those of their mothers 30. The details are shown in the table below. Table is displayed on the page, Age of Parents at Birth of Scientific Men. There are two columns going across, with the number of cases, and the fathers and mothers. Under 20, fathers 0, mothers 2. 20. Onwards, fathers 1, mothers 20. 25 onwards, fathers 15, mothers 26. 30 onwards, fathers 34, mothers 34. 35 onwards, fathers 22, mothers 12. 40 onwards, fathers 17, mothers 5. 45 onwards, fathers 7, mothers 1. 50 and above, fathers 4, mothers no data. 100 total cases. Putting these facts together, viz. 1. That elder sons appear nearly twice as often as younger sons. 2. That as regards intermediate children, the elder and younger halves of the family contribute equally. And 3. That only sons are as common as elder sons. We must conclude that the age of the parents, within the limits with which we chiefly have to deal, has little influence on the nature of the child. Secondly, that the elder sons have on the whole decided advantages of nurture over the younger sons. They are more likely to become possessed of independent means, and therefore able to follow the pursuits that have most attraction to their tastes. 
They are treated more as companions by their parents and have earlier responsibility, both of which would develop independence of character. Probably also the first-born child of families in the world would generally have more attention in his infancy, more breathing space, and better nourishment than his younger brothers and sisters in their several turns. The opposing disadvantage of primogeniture in producing less healthy children and half as many idiots again as the average of the rest of the family has not been sensibly felt, partly because the latter risk is very small, and partly because the mothers of the scientific men are somewhat less youthful than those from whom the above statistical results were calculated. See Duncan on Fertility, etc., 2nd edition, page 293-4, for tabulations of Dr. A. Mitchell's results. An unusual number of the mothers of the scientific men were between 30 and 34 at the time of their birth. This is a very suitable age, according to the views of Aristotle, but undoubtedly older than what Dr. Duncan's statistics, page 387-390, recommend. According to these, the most favourable period for the survival of mother and child, and therefore probably the best in every sense, is when she is 20 to 25, at the time of giving birth. The important question of the effect of the age of the parent on the well-being of the offspring seems never yet to have been treated as strictly and as copiously as it deserves. Dr. Duncan, in the chapter of his work above referred to, has discussed the materials at his disposal with great ingenuity and industry, but adequate statistics sorted according to the various classes of society are still wanting. Fertility the families are usually large to which scientific men belong. I have two sets of returns, the one of brothers and sisters, excluding for the most part those who died in infancy, and the other of brothers and sisters who attained thirty years. In these several cases I have included the scientific man himself, and find, on an average of about one hundred cases, that the total number of brothers and sisters is 6.3 in the first case and 4.8 in the second it is a matter of great interest to compare with these figures the number of the children of the scientific men themselves. It is easy to do so with fairness because the time of marriage proves to be nearly the same in both cases. If anything, the scientific men marry earlier than their parents. It remains to eliminate all cases of absolutely sterile marriages on the part of the scientific men and those in which there might yet be other children born. Having attended to these precautions, I find the number of their living children, say of ages between 5 and 30, to be 4.7. This implies a diminution of fertility as compared with that of their own parents, and it confirms a common belief in the tendency to an extinction of the families of men who work hard with the brain. On the other hand, I shall show that the health and energy of the scientific men are remarkably high. It therefore seems strange that there should be a falling off in their offspring. I have tried in many ways to find characteristics common to those scientific men whose families were the smallest, but have only lighted upon one general result, which I give provisionally, namely, that the relative deficiency of health and energy in respect to that of their own parents is very common among them. Their absolute health and energy may be high, far exceeding those of people generally, but I speak of a noticeable falling off from the yet more robust condition of the previous generation. It is this which appears to be dangerous to the continuance of the race. My figures give the remarkable result that there are no children at all in one out of every three of these cases. I think that ordinary observation corroborates this conclusion, and that those of my readers who happen to have mixed much in what is called intellectual society will be able to recall numerous instances of persons of both sexes, but especially of women, possessed of high gifts of every kind, including health and energy, but of less solid vigour than their parents, and who have no children. I do not overlook the fact that the scientific men are an urban population, being mindful of results I have published elsewhere, Statistical Journal, 1873, which show a similar diminution in the average fertility of townsmen as compared with country folk. But this would not account for their being less prolific than their parents, who were also townsmen, nor for the large number of wholly sterile marriages. Heredity The effects of education and circumstances are so interwoven with those of natural character in determining a man's position among his contemporaries that I find it impossible to treat them wholly apart. 
Still less is it possible completely to separate the evidences relating to that portion of a man's nature which is due to hereditary from all the rest. Heredity and many other cooperating causes must therefore be considered in connection, but I feel sure that as the reader proceeds and becomes familiar with the variety of the evidence, he will insensibly effect for himself much of the required separation. Also, from time to time, as opportunity may offer, I shall attempt to draw distinctions. The study of hereditary form and features in combination with character promises to be of much interest, but it proves disappointing on trial, owing to the impossibility of obtaining good historical portraits. The value of these is further diminished by the passion of distinguished individuals to be portrayed in uniforms, wigs, robes, or whatever voluminous drapery seems most appropriate to their high office, forgetting that all this conceals the man. The practice might well be common of photographing the features from different points of view and at different periods of life in such a way as would be most advantageous to a careful study of the lineaments of the man and his family. The interest that would attach to collections of these in after times might be extremely great. End of chapter 1, part 1 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton Chapter 1, Part 2 of English Men of Science by Francis Galton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Harvey. Chapter 1, Part 2 Pedigrees Thirteen families have been selected. Out of those to which about 120 of the scientific men on my list belong, as appearing noteworthy for their richness in ability during two, three, or more generations, or for any other peculiarity. In some cases, they are also remarkable for purity of type. In some cases, they are also remarkable for purity of type. The facts may, for the most part, be verified by reference to the publications of which the titles are given, and the whole could have been obtained by anyone who cared to search other more or less public sources of information. Five of these families, Bentham, Darwin, Dawson, Turner, Roscoe, and Taylor of Ungar, have already been alluded to in my previous work, Hereditary Genius, whence I have extracted what appeared to the point adding what was necessary. In estimating the number of individuals in each generation, the practice has been usually adopted of not counting those who died young or have not yet attained their thirtieth year. Alderson Many members of this family have been intellectually gifted. There have been an unusual number of cases of mathematical achievement among them. First generation, five males and two females, children of Reverend J. Alderson and his wife, the latter lived to 94. Of these, three males deserve notice. 1. James Alderson, M.D. of Norwich. 2. Robert Alderson, Recorder of Norwich, Ipswich and Yarmouth. 3. John Alderson, founder and president of all the literary and scientific institutions of the time in Kingston-upon-Hull. All these were men of considerable local repute. Second generation, 15 males and 12 females, of whom 5 males and 1 female deserve a special mention. 1. Sir Edward Hall Alderson, baron of the Excelsior, and who the first man of his year at Cambridge, both in mathematics and classics, being senior wrangler and senior classical medalist, a distinction barely equalled in the long annals of university achievement. 2. Robert Woodhouse, also a senior wrangler, Lucasian and Plumian professor of astronomy at Cambridge. 3. The Reverend Samuel H. Alderson, third wrangler and tutor of Chaos College. 4. Sir James Alderson, M.D. F.R.S., 6th Wrangler, for four years President of the Royal College of Physicians. 5. Colonel Ralph Alderson, R.E., a distinguished officer, and one of the first Government Commissioners of Railways. 1. Mrs. Amelia Opie, the novelist, third generation. I have not sufficient information, although I know that it includes many persons of ability, among whom is Major H. Alderson, R.A., a distinguished officer, also a married lady of high artistic powers. Bentham 
a family consisting of only three male representatives, all eminent and one illustrious. First generation, two brothers, one, Jeremy Bentham, jurist of the highest rank, life by Sir J. Bowring, prefixed to the collected works edited by him. Two, General Sir Samuel Bentham, whose early manhood was spent in the Russian service, distinguished for his numerous administrative reforms and singular inventive power afterwards inspector general of naval works in england life by his widow eighteen sixty two second generation one male only george bentham f r s systematic botanist of the highest rank in early life writer on logic for many years president of the linnaean society carpenter among the characteristics of this family are literary and scientific enterprise philanthropic effort nonconformity and aptitude for oral exposition first generation reverend lant carpenter l l d unitarian minister descended from a non-subscribing presbyterian family and married to a wife of similar descent a leading member of the liberal party in exeter and bristol extremely active in the promotion of philanthropic objects both literary and scientific in his studies and a man of local celebrity memoirs by his son eighteen forty two second generation two males and three females of whom both the males and one female require notice one william b carpenter f r s registrar of the london university physiologist a frequent writer and speaker on scientific subjects in many cases connected with social amelioration two dr b p carpenter of montreal conchologist actively engaged in philanthropic work one mary carpenter actively engaged in the foundation and organization of philanthropic institutions especially juvenile reformatories and promoter of female education in india third generation too young for special notice includes an influential dissenting minister and a very successful student darwin there are many instances in this family of a love for natural history and theory and of an aptitude for collecting facts in business-like but peculiar ways speaking from private sources of knowledge i am sure that these characteristics are hereditary rather than traditional there is also a strong element of individuality in the race which is adverse to traditional influence first generation one erasmus darwin m d f r s physician physiologist and poet his botanic garden had an immense reputation at the time it was written for besides its intrinsic merits it chimed in with the sentiments and mode of expression of his day the ingenuity of dr darwin's numerous writings and theories is truly remarkable he was held in very high esteem by his scientific friends including such celebrities as priestley and james watt and it is by a man's position among his contemporaries and competitors that his worth may most justly be appraised unfortunately for his memory he has had no good biographer he was a man of great vigour humour and geniality miss seward's life of him and latterly a pamphlet by dr richardson see also metillard's life of witchwood two his brother robert waring darwin wrote principa botanica which reached its third edition in eighteen ten it is said in metillard's life of witchwood that the darwins sprang from a lettered and intellectual race as his dr darwin's father was one among the earliest members of the spalding club second generation seven males three females of whom three males deserve notice one charles darwin who died at the age of only twenty-one poisoned by a dissection wound but who had already achieved such distinction that his name has been frequently mentioned in biographical dictionaries his thesis on obtaining the gold medal of the edinburgh university was on the distinction between pus and mucus it was a real step forward in those early days of exact medical science and was thought highly of at the time two robert waring darwin m d f r s a physician and shrewd observer of great provincial celebrity on many grounds who lived at shrewsbury he married a daughter of wedgwoods and was father of charles darwin see below three sir francis darwin originally a physician but for many years living in a then secluded part of derbyshire surrounded by animal oddities half while the pigs ran about the woods tamed snakes frequented the house and the like third generation eight males fourteen females of whom three males may be mentioned but illustriously among them one charles darwin f r s 
the aristotle of our days whom all scientific men reverence and love the simple grandeur of those conclusions is as remarkable as the magnitude and multifariousness of their foundation there is much ability in many individuals in this generation who bear the name of darwin and it has been strongly directed to natural history in the case of two a son of sir francis darwin a frequent writer under a well-known nom de plume on sporting matters among those who do not bear that name being children of the daughters of sir erasmus darwin i mention three myself with all humility as falling technically within the limits of the group of scientific men under discussion on the ground of former geographical work and having had much to do in the administration of various scientific societies fourth generation includes very few individuals who have reached mature manhood among these are one george darwin second wrangler at cambridge author of an important article on restrictions to liberty of marriage two captain leonard darwin r a who was second in the competition of his year for woolwich and now engaged on the transit of venus expedition three henry parker fellow of university college oxford classical scholar and chemist dawson turner this family is characterized by great intellectual activity and much artistic taste first generation dawson turner f r s botanist scholar and a man of unwearied activity in collecting and compiling and an encourager of work and others one of his two uncles was a reverend joseph turner senior wrangler in seventeen sixty eight and much distinguished by the personal friendship of mr pitt among his ten male first cousins on the paternal side were the late lord justice turner and his accomplished brothers second generation two males and six females the latter were all remarkable for their energy accomplishments and the large share they took in the literary labour of their father and husbands which was not confined to transcribing three were accomplished artists one a musician another well versed in greek third generation of those above the age of thirty there are five males three females of whom four males deserve mention one dr joseph hooker president of the royal society very eminent botanist director of kew gardens and formerly tibetan traveller and naturalist to an antarctic expedition his father was sir william hooker f r s also one of the first botanists of his day and director of kew gardens two francis palgrave editor of the golden treasury scholar and art critic three gifford palgrave orientalist arabian explorer and author of one of the most remarkable works of travel ever written four r h inglis palgrave statistician the father of the three last was sir francis palgrave historian harcourt scholastic success with much love for science first generation the rev vernon harcourt archbishop of york a man of polished intellect and social gifts second generation ten males and three females of whom four males deserve notice one the rev w vernon harcourt f r s chemist the first president and one of the founders of the british association at a time when science was partially ridiculed and partially denounced he was the chief framer of its elaborate constitution which is i believe a solitary instance of the invention of a complex administrative machinery which worked perfectly from the first and has continued working almost unchanged for nearly half a century it has served as a model upon which many other societies have organized themselves two egerton and three edward vernon harcourt both double firsts at oxford and four granville vernon harcourt who died when an undergraduate at oxford having gained the latin university prize third generation ten males and thirteen females of whom two males deserve mention one sir william vernon harcourt m p lately solicitor general professor of international law at cambridge well known as a political writer under the name historicus two augustus g vernon harcourt f r s a distinguished chemist lee's reader in chemistry at oxford hill the characteristics of this family are active interest in social improvement power of organization mechanical aptitude and general sterling worth its type in the second generation seems to have been unusually pure first generation thomas wright hill descendant from stanch independence and married to a wife of equal vigour and fortitude 
who came from a family noted for mechanical aptitude which she transmitted to her descendants he rose by his own exertions and estimating forty established a school much spoken of at the time on an entirely new principle of management at hazelwood near birmingham the boys were taken into administrative cooperation they regulated their own discipline and the things they learnt were of the most varied kind some men of high note were educated there and among these at least one of the scientific men on my list he gave much attention to mental calculation and even on his deathbed estimating eighty eight invented and successfully applied a new method for determining for any year the date of easter also known for his analysis of articulate sounds and phonography short biographical notice in annual report r astronomical society february thirteenth eighteen fifty two second generation consisted of five males and two females all five males had strong points of resemblance and deserve notice one sir rowland hill k c b and f r s originator and organizer of the system of penny postage which is an influence of the first order of magnitude in modern civilization he was noted in youth for powers of mental calculation and in some points was superior even to zara colburn and george bitter thus he could mentally extract to the nearest integer the cube root of any number not exceeding two thousand millions first inventor eighteen thirty five of rotary printing the method which with slight changes of detail is still in use for newspapers rewarded by three separate grants viz in eighteen forty six by a public testimonial of the value of thirteen thousand three hundred sixty pounds in eighteen sixty four by the award from the treasury of his full salary of two thousand pounds a year on his retirement and in the same year by a parliamentary grant of twenty thousand pounds two matthew davenport hill q c late recorder of birmingham law reformer of note especially in reference to dealings with the criminal class substituting promptitude certainty and strictness for delay uncertainty and severity see law magazine july eighteen seventy two three edwin hill superintendent of the stamp department first inventor of the envelope folding machine since improved by mr d la rue he completely remodelled the stamping machinery at somerset house was most highly commended for these improvements in each of the first three reports of the commissioners of inland revenue and again by a minute on his retirement referring to his eminent and exceptional service he like his brother was a standard writer on dealings with criminals also on currency four arthur headmaster of bruce castle school where he fully developed the principles first laid down by his father five frederick hill formerly inspector of prisons then assistant secretary of the post office a great and thorough reform of the prisons under his observation aiming to fit prisoners for honest life on their release concurrently he contributed numerous memoirs on social improvements generally third generation fourteen males and seventeen females among many of whom the family characteristics continue well marked thus one dr berkeley hill and two miss emily clark of adelaide australia are both actively engaged in work connected with pauper children latrobe a family characterized by its religious bent and musical and literary tastes joined to a love of enterprise first generation benjamin latrobe a convert to the moravians of which esteemable sect he was a patriarch and a mainstay aiken's history of manchester second generation three males zero females two at least of whom deserves notice one christian ignatius latrobe author of the well-known collection of sacred music two benjamin latrobe architect and engineer in america third generation seven males two females of whom two deserve especial notice one charles joseph latrobe governor of victoria at the time of the gold discoveries author of a once extremely popular book on switzerland called the alpenstock which was the precursor of murray's handbooks and more generally diffused knowledge many others of this generation who bear the latrobe name are gifted with the family characteristics two john frederick bateman f r s distinguished engineer fourth generation still young includes colonel osman latrobe who was chief of general lee's staff in america at an early age playfair among the characteristics of this family is an interest in various branches of science joined to a capacity for official work and public action first generation 
Rev. Dr. Playfair, Principal of the University of St. Andrews, author of a work on geography. Second generation, four males and three females, of whom three males deserve notice. 1. George Playfair, M.D., Chief Inspector General of Hospitals in Bengal. He was the head of his profession in India, and author of various medical memoirs. 2. Colonel Sir Hugh Lyon Playfair, who, on his retirement from service, pursued life of incessant activity in public improvement. Numerous biographical notices were written of him soon after his death. 3. Colonel William Playfair, whose memory still lives in India as one of the most accomplished amateur actors. There were two cousins in this generation, the one a very distinguished man, Professor Playfair, the celebrated mathematician and author of the Huttonian theory. The other was Mr. Playfair, an architect of much eminence, to whom many of the principal public buildings in Edinburgh are due. Third generation, 21 males and 20 females, of whom two males deserve a special notice. 1. The Right Honorary Lyon Playfair, M.P., F.R.S., formerly Professor of Chemistry, long engaged in scientific administration of various kinds, and Postmaster General at the close of the late administration. 2. Colonel R. L. Playfair, R.A., the well-known Consul General of Algiers and Naturalist. A third brother is a professor at King's College. Roscoe. The type of this family is strongly marked. It is being characterized by much cultivation, refinement, and poetical taste. First generation. William Roscoe, author of Lorenzo de Medici, Leo X, etc., the above-mentioned characteristics were strongly marked in him. Life by his son, memoirs by Hartley Coleridge in Northern Worthies, and sketches by Washington Irving. Second generation, seven males and three females, of whom four males and two females deserve notice. 1. Thomas Roscoe, editor of Lanzi's History of Painting, and author of many other works. 2. Henry Roscoe, author of a standard book on the law of evidence of British lawyers and of the life of his father. 3 and 4. Both decidedly gifted and authors of poems of merit. 1. Jane Elizabeth Roscoe, a woman of superior mind, intensely interested in public affairs, writer of some poems. 2. Mary Ann Roscoe, authoress of poems of merit. Third generation, 17 males, 16 females, of whom 3 males and 1 female deserve notice. 1. William Cadwell Roscoe, poet and critic, memoirs and collected works by R. H. Hutton. 2. Henry Unfield Roscoe, F.R.S., Professor, Eminent Chemist. 3. William Stanley Jevons, F.R.S., Professor, Author of The Coal Question, and of various works on logic and political economy. 1. Margaret Roscoe. Afterwards, Mrs. Sandback, novelist. Stretchy. An old family, small in numbers, but of a marked and persistent type. Among its characteristics are an active interest in public matters and an administrative aptitude. There have been men of eminence in generations previous to those mentioned below. First generation, Sir Henry Stretchy, Under Secretary of State and otherwise employed in high official posts in India, America and England, Real Negotiator of Peace at Versailles, Stanhope's History of England. Received Medal of Society of Arts for having introduced indigo into Florida. Second generation, three males, one female, of whom two males deserve notice. 1. Sir Henry Strachey, Indian judge, called by James Mill in his History of India, the wisest of the company's servants. Aided much in the organization of the Indian Judicial Administration. 2. Edward Strachey author of reports of acknowledged weight on Indian judicial subjects. Fifth report. Third generation, six males and one female, of whom three males deserve notice. One, Sir John Strachey, eminent in all branches of civil administration in India. Two, Henry Strachey, Tibetan explorer, gold medalist of the Royal Geographical Society. Three, Major General Richard Strachey, R.E. F.R.S., active administrator of Indian engineering work. Physical Geographer Taylor is a von Gar. Numerous members of this family have shown a curious combination of restless literary talent, artistic taste, evangelical disposition and mechanical aptitudes. There is an interesting work published upon it called Family Pen by the Reverend Isaac Taylor, 1867. 
see below in the fourth generation, which contains a list of 90 publications by 10 different members of the family up to that time, and there have been more publications and at least one new writer since. First generation. Isaac Taylor came to London with an artist's ambition, ended up being a reputable engraver. He acted for many years as secretary to the Incorporated Society of Artists of Great Britain, which was the forerunner of the Royal Academy. All the family characteristics were strongly marked in him. Second generation consisted of three males, all of whom deserve notice. 1. Charles Taylor, a learned recluse, editor of Calmet's Bible. 2. Reverend Isaac Taylor, author of Scenes in Europe, etc., educated as an engraver and far surpassing his father in ability. He married Anne Martin, a woman of reputed genius, authoress of the family mansion and the numerous able members of the Taylor family for the two next generations sprung, with one exception from this fortunate union. 3. Josiah Taylor, eminent publisher of architectural works. He made a large fortune. Third generation. Descendants of Isaac Taylor and Anne Martin, three males and three females, of whom two males and two females deserve notice. 1. Isaac Taylor, author of Natural History of Enthusiasm. 2. Jeffreys Taylor, author of Ralph Richards, Young Islanders, etc. 1 and 2. Anne and Jan Taylor, joint authors of Original Poems. Anne married the Reverend Joseph Gilbert. In this same generation is ranked the Reverend Howard Hinton, a leading Baptist minister who was a son of one of the sisters in the previous generation and his father of a well-known aurist. Fourth generation, six males and nine females now living, and some few others who are deceased. Of these, five males and one female deserve special notice. 1. Reverend Isaac Taylor, author of Words and Places of the Family Pen and of Etruscan Researches. 2. Josiah Gilbert, author of The Dolomite Mountains. 3. Joseph Gilbert, FRS, eminent for his chemical and physiological researches in their relation to agriculture. The paternal race of Gilbert had also a marked type. 4. Thomas Martin Herbert, independent minister, scholar and writer. 5. Edward Gilbert Herbert, of the Chancery Bar, who died young of diphtheria. 1. Helen Taylor, authoress of Sabbath Bells. Wedgwood. This family is curious for the sporadic character of its ability, as shown by the number of its members and rather distant relationships who have become distinguished. The Wedgwoods must originally have been a pure type, because the name was prevalent in the village where the great potter was born, and the bearers of it were largely interrelated, and followed the same craft. He himself married a Wedgwood, who was a third cousin, and both his father and grandfather were potters. Meteard's Life First Generation Josiah Wedgwood, FRS, father of British pottery, whose once abundant works now fetch fabulous prices. Second generation, three sons and four daughters. One son deserves notice, viz. Thomas Wedgwood, who died young. His abilities were great. He was an ardent experimentalist, and has some claim to rank as the first person who ever made a photograph. See page 7. Third generation, including descendants from the sisters of Josiah Wedgwood, contains one... Hensley Wedgwood, English Dictionary and Origin of Language. 2. Charles Darwin, FRS, C under Darwin. 3. Sir Henry Holland, Bart, MD, FRS, who died subsequently to my having begun this inquiry. 4. S. H. Parks, MD, FRS, Professor of Hygiene to the Army Medical School. 4th Generation, C under Darwin. Statistical Results let us now look at the near relations of the scientific men from a purely statistical point of view, combining those already quoted with the rest and calculate the proportion of them who have achieved distinction. It appears from my returns, which are rather troublesome to deal with owing to incompleteness of information, that 120 scientific men have certainly not more than 250 brothers, 460 uncles and 1,200 male cousins who reach adult life. They have somewhat less than 120 fathers and 240 grandfathers, because the list contains brothers and cousins. I will take two groups. 1. Grandfathers and uncles, both paternal and maternal, say about 660 persons. 2. Brothers and male cousins on both sides, 1,450 persons. On the supposition, which is somewhat in excess of the fact that I am dealing with complete information concerning the families of 120 scientific men, 
I find in the first group of 660 persons, one, Jeremy Bentham, a great leader of thought and founder of a school of philosophy, two, Wedgwood, the father of a national industry in art, three, Compton, the inventor of a machine for cotton manufacture, which gave a timely impetus to the great national industry, four, Maskelyne, an astronomer royal, five, Playfair, the scientific head of a Scotch university, six, William Smith, founder of British geology, seven, Harcourt, the lawgiver and first president of the British Association, eight, Pemberton Milnes, who refused both the secretaryship of state and a peerage. 9. Latrobe, who was to the very worthy sect of the Morovians much what Barclay was to the Quakers, that is to say, not its founder, but a great supporter to it. 10 and 11. Two archbishops, Harcourt of York and Broderick of Gashel. 12. Erasmus Darwin, poet and philosopher of high repute in his day. 13. Isaac Taylor, author of Natural History of Enthusiasm, etc. I will stop here, though it would be easy to extend the list considerably if I took a slightly lower level of celebrity for my limit. Every one of these thirteen men, when he died, was or would have been, if he had not been previously outlived his reputation, the subject of numerous obituary notices, and his death an event of sufficient public interest to warrant his being reckoned as an eminent man. I formally calculated and have since seen no reason to doubt my conclusion that the annual obituary of the united kingdom does not include more than fifty men who are eminent in that sense therefore this small band of six hundred and sixty individuals contains almost one-fourth as much eminence as is annually produced by the united kingdom a different criterion of eminence may be found in the number of celebrated men reared in the universities whither a large proportion of the brightest youths of the nation find their way I examined the lists of honours at Cambridge in the ten years 1820-09, inclusive, and also the four years 1842-5, of which I happen to have some personal knowledge, whence it appeared to me that on the average 660 Cambridge students do not produce more than three men whose general eminence is of equal rank to that of the thirteen men in the 660 grandfathers and uncles under consideration. A more exact test and the best of which I can think is to examine into the fate of the boys at large schools. It is not difficult to learn the productiveness of each school as regards eminence, because there are annual gatherings to which former school boys who have won distinction are generally invited and not unfrequently come. As men begin to distinguish themselves at thirty-five, and may be supposed willing to attend on such occasions till seventy, the notabilities invited to be present at school gatherings present the product of, say, thirty-five years. I feel sure that six hundred and sixty middle-class boys do not turn out more than a fraction of one eminent man, though they may turn out many who do well in life and earn fortunes and local repute. The second of the group consists, as already mentioned, of brothers and male cousins, making a total of about 1,450 men. I will examine the achievements of these solely in respect to high university success, partially because several of the cousins are too young to have had time fully to distinguish themselves otherwise. Let us limit ourselves to the following names. The list would be lengthened if we took a lower level. Cambridge, 1. Alderson, both first classic and senior wrangler, that is, first mathematician of his year at Cambridge, 2. Woodhouse, senior wrangler, 3. Main, Senior Wrangler. 4. Humphrey, Senior Classic. 5. Scott, Joint Senior Classic. Oxford. Here the method of examination affords no means of ascertaining who is absolutely the first of his year, since the men are grouped alphabetically in classes, and not according to their order of merit in those classes. The names I will select are those of men who were in the first class and have subsequently distinguished themselves, viz. 6. Moberly, headmaster of Winchester, now Bishop of Salisbury. 7. Francis Palgrave, critic. 8. Honorary George Broderick. First class, both in classics and history, well known as an influential, though anonymous, writer. It is a remarkable fact, or coincidence, that five men out of a group of 1,450, or say one out of every 300, should be first in his year in the single university of Cambridge, either in mathematics or in classics. This is about the proportion that exists among the men who actually go to Cambridge, and these, as before mentioned, 
are no chance selections but include a large part of the annual pick of the intellectual flower of the whole nation moreover these distinguished brothers and cousins of scientific men are themselves interrelated the two senior wranglers alderson and woodhouse being first cousins and the two classics scott and broderick being first cousins also both families being in other respects rich in ability we may otherwise appreciate the influence of heredity as distinguished from that of tradition and education by observing the similarity of disposition that sometimes prevails among numerous scattered branches of the same family the two following extracts from the replies i have received are illustrations of what i mean one my numerous relatives though unknown to fame are mostly characterized by a great breadth of thought and rare independence of action these characteristics seem clearly traced by the writer to a great-grandparent who immigrated from germany two counting third cousins i have scores and scores of relatives and scarcely an unsteady person among them i have numerous returns in which the writer analyzes his own nature and confidently ascribes different parts of it to different ancestors one correspondent has ingeniously written out his natural characteristics in red blue and black inks according to their origin a method by which its anatomy is displayed at a glance my data afford an approximate estimate of the ratio according to which effective ability hereditary gifts plus education plus opportunity is distributed throughout the different degrees of kinship they state one the number of kinsmen in the several near degrees two the number of those among them who were in any sense public men and three the number of those who not been publicly known had nevertheless considerable reputation among their friends it is therefore only requisite after some previous revision to add the returns together and to compare the number of distinguished kinsmen in their various degrees with the total number of kinsmen in those degrees to obtain results whose ratio to one another is the one we are in search of these conclusions are not materially vitiated by the fact that different correspondents may have different estimates of what constitutes distinction so long as each writer is consistent to his own scale i have tried to figure in many ways without any revision at all with moderate revision and with careful sifting and i find the proportions to come out much the same in every case in comparing these with previous results obtained from an analysis of men of much higher general eminence hereditary genius page three hundred seventeen i find the falling off in ability from the central figure the hero of the family to be less rapid as the distance of the kinship increases there is however one group in that book consisting of divines whose general eminence is not so great as the rest and which also resembles the scientific men in the family distribution of ability my former figures for one hundred divines gave twenty-two notable fathers forty-two brothers twenty-eight grandfathers and forty-two uncles my present results for one hundred scientific men are twenty-eight thirty-six twenty and forty respectively as regards the relative influence of the paternal and maternal lines i find close equality my method of comparison is by setting off paternal grandfathers and paternal uncles against maternal grandfathers and maternal uncles no other near degree of kinship being available for the purpose my results for one hundred scientific men are paternal grandfathers public characters ten of high private reputation three paternal uncles thirteen and eight making a total on the paternal side of thirty-four on the other hand the maternal grandfathers are eleven and four maternal uncles fifteen and seven make a total on the maternal side of thirty-seven i leave to other chapters some remarks about the relative value of maternal and paternal educational influences on scientific men End of chapter 1 of English Men of Science